the uh, talk today is on the role of the causal body in evolution, that is, in our evolution. Now, is there anybody uh, in this room who's not aware of what the three bodies are according to uh, Michael Chaka's psychology? You're not. Okay, who's going to tell her? Bill? I think her difficulty is with the English language, yes. right? <laughs> oh, oh. Yeah. That's, that's, True. that one we can't yeah, handle. Okay, thank you. She knows, but she's got to refresh her memory. Okay. Um, the causal body is the one that most strongly associated with thinking. And we're going to be talking about thinking this afternoon. Uh, thinking is something that involves all three bodies, but we want to uh, emphasize the causal body. So let's start off with a couple of questions. Uh, how many of you have any dissatisfaction, dissatisfaction with the way that you think? Look around the room, folks. Almost everybody. Okay. Can anybody tell us what what their dissatisfaction is? Mm. Too many random thoughts. Too many random thoughts. Random thoughts and don't follow through on any one particular thought. And you don't follow through on any one. Okay, that's very common. Too many negative thoughts. Negative thoughts. Not only random, but negative. Okay. Anybody else have any other... Sometimes you get obsessed on an idea and it goes like a mm -hmm. tape recording. It's called perseveration. The idea keeps going around and around yes. and around. The same idea. Yes, that's perseveration that's called. And um, that can be annoying. That's, that's what you're telling me. Okay. Anybody have any other... Uh, yes. Thought, yes. Anything productive for myself would trigger my anxiety attacks. It contributes to your anxiety? Yes? Okay, that's an example of a, a thoughts amplifying an emotion, okay? There's a very close uh, connection between our thoughts and our emotions, and we want to develop that idea today. Uh, and so that's an example of it, yes. Any other uh, uh, problems people have with their thinking? Yeah, the lack of uh, will, the lack of have the idea and make it manifest. The lack of will. Okay, I'm glad that uh, Enrique used the word will because that's something that is very important and we want to understand where it comes from and how important it is. Okay, these are all excellent uh, questions. Um, let me note that thinking is a very complex subject. Just the questions you've asked indicate that already. It's a very complex subject. We're certainly not going to cover it all this afternoon, but we are going to cover a few points that may be helpful in enabling you to continue thinking. Now, I'll uh, mention another uh, issue here, and that is uh, almost everybody in the room put up their hand that they weren't satisfied with their thinking. If I asked the same question to most other people, most other groups, I would probably get the same answer. There are very few people that are can say, well, I'm perfectly satisfied with my thinking. You might wonder about them if they tell you that. Um, so what is the issue? The issue is that we are very complex cre creatures, that thinking is a complex activity, and that we've never been taught how to think. How many of you had a class in school how to think? Nobody. It's assumed you could do it. By chance, some people are going to do it fairly well. They do good in school. By chance, other people are going to be terrible at it. And most people muddle along in between. So what we are interested in is the role of the causal body in evolution, and I mean the evolution of the species. So when we talk about the evolution of humanity, I think it's important for me to, to make this point for you. We are not going to evolve uh, another organ. We're not going to develop another head or another arm. But we are going to develop an increased 
integration of our three bodies. And that integration of our three bodies will enable us to do things with almost the equivalent of growing another head. Because once you have begun to integrate your three bodies, you are, uh, have available to you certain sensitive energies which are in the room all the time, in the universe all the time. It's just that we can't perceive them. So we have to evolve our bodies to the point that we can perceive that which is already all around us. And the work that uh, we're doing here with Shamji is a start in that direction. And we're all going to be doing it for the rest of our lives because there are very few of us that won't need that. So you want to see yourself as being uh, lucky to be living now at your age in the 21st century where all sorts of good things are happening, all sorts of bad things are also happening at the same time, but that's the way evolution works. All sorts of good things are happening and there is a possibility of an enormously bright future eventually. But the people who are alive today are going to have to work hard to bring it about and they're going to have to work on themselves to bring it about. It's not, this is not the kind of evolution where you can sort of sit back and relax and then when you're ready you go to the uh, grocery store and buy it. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not a product. It's, it's an energy that you yourself are generating. You're generating energy all the time and what you may not realize is you are capable of generating better energy than you're right generating at this moment. And that's true of everybody. So we all have to learn how to get in touch with our better energies and generate them, create them. Any questions up to this point? Okay. Um, this is a, a point that I've written down here. Often our thoughts, our feelings, and our actions are not coordinated. And uh, Enrique is talking about will. We don't have the will. In other words, we say, oh, I want to do this. That's our intention. Our intention is there, but our follow through to actually do it is not. That's because our three bodies are not that well integrated. So as you work at your uh, three body purification and other practices of microchakra psychology, your bodies will come together and things will become easier. Your thinking will has a certain level of difficulty to it right now. I could have asked a different question. I could have asked you how many of you found, find some difficulty with your thinking, and probably the way you answered it indicates you do. And those difficulties will become less as the three bodies become integrated because the energies are flowing more readily. More, you're designed to ultimately process information at uh, very high rates of speed. As a matter of fact, I think it's in the Bible somewhere, New Testament or Old Testament, and ye shall become uh, creatures of light. That is the evolutionary pathway for the human, that you will have light bodies. We won't, not in this, not in this uh, incarnation, but the, the species at a certain point in time will be operating with light uh, in addition to or the place of what we now consider our normal. So we're moving in that direction very slowly, but much more rapidly than in previous uh, generations. In other words, 21st century is the opportunity to things really start to move. Okay, now there's a distinction which I hope you're familiar with, but I'm going to check, and that is the distinction between awareness and consciousness. Now I know that the, the book uh, Michael Chakras was translated into French and they had a terrible time uh, in France because in France they don't have the word for awareness. It's no, it's, it's no different than the word from consciousness. So that created some major headaches for the people who are translating it. Now those of you who are Spanish speaking, I want to ask you, is there a word for awareness as distinct from consciousness in Spanish? It's the nope. same thing. That you same thing. Yeah. Okay, then we better get in touch with uh, the people who are translating the book into Spain, into Spanish, and they're going to have to work that one out as well. They may want to borrow some ideas from the French, I don't know. But it's unfortunate because, uh, so let's review that distinction, particularly for those of you who are Spanish-speaking. 
Let's see if today we can get some sort of a, uh, an answer to this or a suggested answer. In other words, imagine that those who are Spanish speaking, imagine now you were going to translate the book Microchakras into Spanish. How would you deal with this particular question? Um, consciousness, as Shamji must have explained to you, uh, is everything. It's all pervading. It's uh, throughout the universe. It's, it's uh, eternal. It doesn't change. It's unchanging. And there is nothing in the universe, the whole universe, that includes this planet, other planets, other solar systems. There's nothing in the universe that's, that does not have its origins in consciousness. So people uh, frequently ask the question, particular materialistic scientists, uh, where did consciousness come from? And so the, the number of them are very busy trying to explain how consciousness emerged from matter, how the molecules of matter got together and somehow produced consciousness. And they, there are articles that are still coming out on that. It's nonsense. There is no such uh, thing. Consciousness is that which originally was there. It was eternal. It was always there. It will always be there. The only question is how did, uh, not that how did consciousness emerge from matter, but how did matter emerge from consciousness? That's, that's the uh, basic scientific issue. So we are all matter, or at least those, those parts of us that are physical, and this all emerged from consciousness. So you cannot improve consciousness. You cannot create consciousness. You cannot destroy consciousness. But you can work with awareness, because human awareness in English is a different matter. It is not consciousness. It is you might call it the representative of consciousness in the human, but it is different from consciousness because it is mortal. It dies when the physical body dies. So it, it exists during the lifetime of the individual. Now, it is through awareness that you evolve. So are the individuals who are more aware are ones who are further along the path of evolution. And that seems to be in the order of nature, that the purpose of life is the development of awareness, particularly in the human. Animals I won't speak of, I don't know anything about them. But in the humans, uh, it, it is in, in increasing awareness, life after life after life. So that you now, when we come to the 21st century, we now have the first century in human history where we have a global civilization. The whole world is becoming connected, interconnected. I mean, you have TV now, with, uh, they have instant news from this, something happens in this part of the world, and it's instantly broadcast throughout the whole world. So it's called the global village. You may have all heard that expression. So now the species moves from living in their little local village in some country to living in the global village. And so what happens to you is very much interconnected with what's happening to several billion other people. So now you have a situation where you have a job to do because you're here. And we'll use, maybe we come back to one of the Indian terms that's very useful in, in, this, in thinking about our job. That is our dharma. That is our duty. What is our duty? And that's one of the things you need to think about. If you're going to engage in so-called spiritual thinking, you must be asking yourself, what is my dharma? What should I be doing? And that's not, a, it's all, not always easy to answer that question. It's particularly easy if you're a parent. There's no doubt. You have to look after your children. But if you're not a parent and uh, you don't have that responsibility, then you can look around you at the whole world and say, okay, what is my dharma? What am I supposed to be doing? And maybe it's economic that you have to do certain things in order to make a living. Maybe it's to protect your country. Maybe it's to uh, work for some organization which has uh, certain worthy goals. But those are individual choices. So living as a human being and doing your dharma requires making decisions. That's thinking. So 
So we can get into the details of what is involved in making a decision and becoming more aware of how complex, how our complex thought processes can be analyzed. In other words, you don't have to just accept, well, they're complex thought processes. No. We're going to go into some much more detailed analysis of what thinking really is. And uh, it covers a lot, far more than I can go do with, do with you today. But it covers a lot of territory. And uh, it's interesting to me. I got interested in this uh, subject uh, years ago when I first uh, started college. And the uh, subject of thinking somehow fascinated me. And uh, <clears throat> there are many people throughout uh, the, the world, and particularly throughout the English-speaking world, who have thought about thought and have written about it. And there's all sorts of books on it. But they're not, um, they're not interconnected, and they're not widely known. I mean, if some guy writes a book, maybe he's a professor at a university, and uh, a couple of hundred other people are made aware of the book, and that's it, and he dies, the book dies, and, you, and now we go. So there's a lot of work to be done to have a systematic educational system that takes thinking as seriously as it really should be taken. I mean, and there, they take, for example, nutrition. There are people who laugh at nutrition. And there are other people who have made it a, uh, a study and have learned quite a bit. But it's a struggle for them. They have to work up against the attitudes of those who say, ah, put it, you, you are what you eat, don't worry about what you eat. Okay, that's their view of nutrition. You are what you think, you think what you think, don't worry about it. That's not going to get you very far particularly in the area of thinking. You have to become an expert in thinking for yourself, not for anybody else, but for yourself. You have to become the expert in your thinking. And you must find ways to in which to improve your thinking. Because that's, thinking is going to create your tomorrow. You're creating yourself. Now, there was a psychologist uh, called Maslow, whom I've mentioned in other classes, and he, had, he made uh, several points that I want to re reiterate with you. One of them was, he talked about self-actualizing creativity. That is, you create yourself by, uh, by working at it. You don't, you don't, it don't, doesn't just happen. So you have to be able to examine yourself. You have to be able to be critical of yourself. You have to be able to set goals for yourself. You have to find a way to pursue those goals. You have to look at the obstacles which are in your path because all of thinking means uh, uh, attacking obstacles, overcoming obstacles. So the fact that you're sitting in this room today means that you have overcome a certain number of obstacles or you wouldn't be here. So to go on further means you're going to have to overcome more obstacles. And as you, uh, I, I, my favorite quote about in all of that is from the former president of the United States, Harry Truman. They, they said uh, he was being interviewed and the reporter said to him, Mr. Truman, uh, when you're dead, uh, what do you want them to put on your tombstone? And he said, he did his damnedest meaning he did his utmost. And that's all you can do. But by doing your utmost, you are advancing your dharma, your duty. And ultimately, you move toward the atma. Now, let me give you a couple of more quotes from Maslow as I tie in here, and then I want to get into something else with you. Uh, there was a saying that Maslow had, or a teaching of his, that I'm going to repeat for those of you who haven't heard it. Um, Maslow got excited one day. He says, I've discovered the missing link between the apes and civilized man. Anybody guess who that was? What's the missing link between the apes and civilized man? First of all, what's a missing link? Okay, Bill, help us out. What's a missing link? Yeah. Well, if if to if 
two ends of something are obvious and how one got to the other side, mm -hmm. you know, how the beginning part wound up being the end part. Right. It's not obvious something is missing. <laughs> right, yes, so okay. That's what they tell So they saw it, see the apes as the beginning, mm -hmm. and they see civilized man as the end. And what is the missing link? Well, his answer was, it's us. A little tricky here. We're the missing link. Because civilized man isn't, has not yet occurred. In other words, most people would assume, oh, civilized man, he means us. No, we're not civilized. We're something that precedes civilized man. And civilized man will occur once the thought processes are fully functioning, as I've been suggesting to you. So you want to get that, I think he gives you great perspective with that uh, saying, of, that teaching of his, that we have to look at ourselves personally and all of our friends and all of our society and all of our all excitement about the presidential election and who's going to be president and all of that. It just blips on the screen. The pro progress is much slower, but it is picking up. And it's it is uh, cross personalities. It's it's a uh, it's like a a wave that is going through humanity, and that wave that is going through humanity is carrying it forward. There's a lot that, that's going on at the same time that seems to be carrying it backwards. But those are those are problems, and uh, on all levels of history, there's always been problems, but the history keeps moving. So you want to see yourself as part of that flow of history and you want to look around to, uh, to other people that you know and, they, and say, okay, now where are they? Where, how do they see themselves? What are they thinking about themselves? What do they think they're doing? I mean, that's a, that's, a, that's a thought that has occurred to me many times. I look at people, I see they're very busy doing something and I see, say to myself, what do they think they're doing? It's, it's mind-boggling. It's mind-boggling how serious people can take themselves and how little they're really doing. So you want to have some humility as you approach your spiritual development. At the same time, you want to have some pride that it is a worthwhile task, that you are a worthwhile task, that if you weren't, you wouldn't be here. Very simple. If the universe didn't think they wanted you, you wouldn't be here, we guarantee it. So the universe thinks enough of you is to allow you to be here. We had uh, a man you may have seen his video here, Swamiji. Uh, how many have seen his videotapes? Yeah, uh, he was from India and uh, he lived the life of a holy man in, in the latter half of his life. And he said uh, he was very thankful that he had a human body. He said, I'm going to take the best advantage I can of having a human body because I don't, have, I don't know that the next incarnation I'm going to have a human body. He felt that according to his thinking, the, uh, he may have done something in his past which was a dharmic, which is not in line with dharma, and he would be punished by having to take on the body of an animal for some period of time. That, that may be. Who knows? I don't know. But he felt that way very strongly. So he was glad that he had a human body. So what I'm saying to you is you also should be glad that you have a human body and make the best of it that you possibly can. That's all. Don't, don't set impossible goals. Don't say, well, I've got to do this, I've got to do that. I'm, I'm terrible if I don't do that. You don't want any of that crap. You just want to go about doing your, leading your life, making your decisions, using your, your, your brain, and accomplishing as much as reasonable. But it is part of what other people who are on a spiritual path are also doing. And everybody is moving towards some sort of a destiny that we do not foresee, we do not understand. It is beyond our understanding. And uh, I think in a previous class I mentioned that we have to, uh, we have to understand that there is an intelligence in the universe which is greater than human intelligence. And intelligence, not random forces, not uh, you know mechanical events, but an intelligence 
that is guiding all life. And it's that intelligence that you want to get in touch with. We'll come to that in a minute. Where you use your own personal intelligence to contact what one psychiatrist called the wisdom of the over-self. Uh, but the over-self, the, the psychiatrist was a Sagioli, he was an Italian psychiatrist. And um, by the over-self, he meant that each of us, in addition to our three bodies, he didn't use the, the understanding of three bodies, he didn't have that understanding. But in addition to whatever uh, we, he regarded that we had, uh, there was a, um, an intelligence which was greater than the human intelligence that we could contact. Now, some people have a very strong sense of this. Some people have no sense of it at all, and some people laugh at it. Um, there was a, a boxer in the 1950s who wrote a book called Somebody Up There Likes Me. And bo boxer's name was Rocky Graziano. And he wrote a book about the various events in his life where things just seemed to happen very favorably for him. It, it wasn't accident. It was the right thing at the right time helped him move along his path, his dharmic path. And people who are on a spiritual path have some sense of this. They have some sense, sometimes it's called divine guidance, they have some sense that there is a force, an intelligence, which manifests to them and guides them, hey, you should be doing this or you shouldn't be doing this. And these suggestions are coming from a, an intelligence that is incorporated in their field at the time of their birth and doesn't go away. It's there. Most people are unaware of it. Most people don't make any use of it. But some people, particularly in a crisis situation, when things are terrible, when things are really bad, they learn to, they learn to find it. And in that uh, crisis situation, they find it. And then you can't talk them out of it. They know it's there. So the, what we're suggesting is that there are ways in which you can uh, get in touch with that over-self, to use the Sagioli's term, you can get in touch with that over self, but you don't have to be in a crisis to do it. Uh, in other, you can get in touch in a crisis or outside of a crisis, but you can get in touch with it. And that gives you a sense that you are not alone in the universe. Many people suffer from loneliness. I'm all alone. You're not. You may think you are, but you're not. And you uh, need to understand that in order to, to develop the spirit that is required for your spiritual development. You just got to move ahead and uh, make use of the subtle things which are there. Now, I'm going to, that gives me your third teaching of Maslow's, which I'm going to read to you, and then we'll, we'll move on. He was talking about inner nature. And he said, inner nature is weak and delicate and <coughs> subtle and easily overcome by bad habits and wrong attitudes toward it. So what he was saying is let's develop our inner nature, but that the inner nature that we're trying to develop is weak and delicate and subtle, and if we have a bad attitude toward it, or a bad habit, we ain't gonna develop it. So we are nurturing our own delicate inner nature. That, that's what you're doing when you're going spiritually. So in the Indian system you have energy described as tamas, rajas, and sattva. Tamas is a heavy, lethargic energy. Rajas is very active, energetic. And the sattva is very pure and very light. Remember we're talking about light. So the inner nature is light. It is weak, it is delicate compared to Thomas, compared to Rajas. It is weak, it is, but it is, uh, ultimately it's the strongest. But you have to nurture it as you would nurture a plant. 
So the young plant is delicate, weak, and you have to nurture it and care for it in order to grow it. So in this body, that in this physical body, which is the, the strongest at the material level, you have to nurture a body which is weaker at the subtle level. Ultimately, it will be the strongest body. But it won't become the strongest body unless you nurture it, make it the strongest body. If you don't nurture it, it ain't going to happen. So this is part of the dharma of every human, is to nurture their own weak inner body. Okay, that's, that was uh, Maslow's teaching. Maslow, uh, for those of you who wouldn't know, was a famous psychologist in the 1960s. And uh, today, I mean, he's, he's ancient history. 1960s is ancient history. Okay. Uh, now, there is a there are terms that we need to uh, get clear in our minds. Ego and self. We already learned that in uh, French and in Spanish there is no word for awareness. We have to come back to that one. Um, ego and self is a problem in English because ego and self are words that are used interchangeably. Sometimes they're used to mean the same thing. Sometimes they're used to mean different things. And if it were not so crucial, I wouldn't even waste my time talking to you about it. They'd say, well, that's just a you know, strange thing in the English language. But it's crucial. Because when I say crucial, what I mean is this. Shramshi has given us a new model for psychology. Before Shramshi, there was no such thing as microchakras. And there was no logical model in psychology. That's one of the reasons psychology has never really attained much stature as a science compared to other sciences. It's younger. It's only maybe a little over 100 years old. Uh, physics is about 500 years old. So physics is a mature science. Psychology is an infant science. And psychology... Uh, has based its theory on what's called the correlation coefficient, which is a mathematical relationship of one thing being mathematically related to another, but it's not a cause and effect relationship. So there was no good cause and effect model in psychology. Now, the theory of microchakras is a cause-effect model, and it's a very detailed, logical model. And we are only now beginning to learn how to exploit it so it's like Shamji has brought us the basic model. Now we have to learn how to develop it and use it and implement it in the whole field of psychology. That's a big job. So we just get started on it in our generation. But what's important, the reason I mention this now, is we need a model uh, as vocabulary. And I'm going to discuss with you uh, shortly some of the aspects of the importance of vocabulary. So any scientific model has a vocabulary. Now the vocabulary is going to be, have an influence upon everybody who works with the model. So if it's a profession, like for example in architecture, there are certain terms that are used for describing buildings. If you're an architect, you know these terms. And, that, and that they enable you to function and communicate well with other architects. So similarly, if you're a psychologist and you want to communicate with other psychologists, you need a vocabulary that at least, if you've all got degrees in psychology, you at least know what you're talking about. There is no guaranteed universal psychology vocabulary. There, there are words that have come up and get popularly used for a while, then die, or people fight over them, whatever. Uh, but that's because of the young science. As that, you, couldn't, you couldn't have a science of physics if the physicists today, 500 years after uh, the founding of physics, were still fighting over basic vocabulary. You couldn't have a science. So we're looking forward <coughs> to the time when psychologists will have agreed upon, yeah, this is our basic vocabulary, this is our basic science. We need that. So a major candidate for such a vocabulary are, are the microchakras, 
the other terms that Chomsky has introduced in the book there, and and then we're away to the races. Now we need to add to it. We need to do a lot of other things, but it's a start at a logical system. Now the advantage of a logical system is that you can teach people to think in terms of that system. So if you tell someone that their third microchakra of the second chakra is blocked, you know what we're talking about in, in Shanghai's system. There's no other system that is that precise about, uh, about the uh, energy flows in the human being. So you have a way of talking precisely about energy flow within the human. And the vocabulary that we use is very important. Now, back to ego. In the third uh, micro chakra of each chakra resides what Chandra is calling the ego of the chakra. Now, let's, let's stop for a moment and ask ourselves in terms of common sense, what does ego mean? Somebody explain to me what an ego is. Anybody? Yeah. Things need to survive. Beg your pardon? Uh, things we need to survive. We need it. We need it to yes. survive. To survive? But, and then sometimes we get more attached to something and need more than we need. You mean you, we might need we might need more than we may We have ego to survive. We need an ego in order to do things. Yes, yes, yes. We need an ego. Okay, so we're, we're not going to argue on that one. We need an ego. But what is it exactly, an ego? Is the, the, the force that is behind the, it? Be pardon? Is, is the, the framework be, behind will? It's a framework behind will, yes. That's part of it. Yes? Ego is the way I understand it is having consciousness that I exist and I have identity um, and I have a story of myself so it's the awareness that I exist that I am here. Yes, it's an organizational construct. It enables you to organize your experience and say well these are all these these belong to me this, yeah. and, and these ones don't. Yeah. This, this, I can identify, it sets, it sets things up for identification. So I can identify with these things as mine and these things are not mine. Yes, it's a central, it's a focusing point. It's a focusing point. Now, what's the difference between ego and self? Is there any difference? Ego is related to the mind. Yes. To the body, but the self is not. Conscious. You're on the right, both of you are on the right track. Can anybody, can you elaborate a little, little more? Well, to simplify, you would say the ego is me. Yeah. And the self is I. The ego is an object, and the I is a subject. It's the self is the conscious. Ego is the object, and the I is the subject. Um, I gave you there's a, there, are, there are people who would argue, the, who would agree with you on that. <laughs> I'm not sure that I'm one of them. Um, the reason I'm doubting that is this. Um, the concept of the self uh, in other words, it depends on who, who, who you're talking about. There are, it depends which writer you're talking about. There are some people who will use the word egos and, and self interchangeably. Others have distinct meanings for them. I'm thinking of self in, uh, in a conjunction with uh, Shamji's uh, citation of one of the Upanishadas. The self is, uh, the self is something which can be experienced. Okay? So it's not an object, that, that's for sure. It's the subject. But there is a phenomenon that, uh, how many have heard of Uspensky? One, two, three, four. Yeah, uh, Uspensky was a fantastic thinker. Um, I read Uspensky, I believe it was in the 1950s. 
in prehistoric times. And um, the, the uh, I will go back to him from time to time and find things that are fresh. He, he, uh, he was a, what they would call a mystical thinking thinker. And he was talking about self-remembering. Self-remembering as the most important aspect of his whole teaching. And I never understood what that could possibly mean. Self-remembering is the most important, because he says a number of things that are very inter interesting, I think very important. But why is self-remembering the most important? Well, I had an experience recently, maybe a year or so ago, and I finally understood what he was talking about. Because it was an experience of self-remembering. didn't last very long, but it was an experience of, oh, and that was my sense of who myself was, who I was, my subjectivity. So self-remembering from the standpoint of Uspensky is a state that is beyond the egos. Now, we want to think of the ego, at least for starters now, we can, we can be flexible about this as we develop this, this work. But for the moment, let's think of the ego as associated with the third micro of each chakra, as the, as the center of focus of the mind of the chakra. So in that case, it's not so much that it's not a subject or that it is an object. It can be, it's, a, it, it's just as much a subject as it is an object. It's a center of focus. And it's the center of organization. You're organizing your first chakra experiences around your first chakra ego. You organize your second chakra experiences around your second chakra ego and so on up the ladder. So you have a, a locus, a, a point of organization of your experiences. Because what you, need, what you need to do in order to develop this complex system that is a human being, you need a system of organization. You have to begin to look at yourself in an organized fashion. If you don't have any theory this is why up to the pre up, up until the theory of microchakras, uh, psychology you couldn't get you couldn't teach people very much by t talking to them about correlation coefficients, and that's all the, the contemporary psychologists could do. They could, they could throw in a little Freud and a little Jung, and maybe a few others, but it was always hit or mat, hit or miss. Nothing systematic about it. So now we have an, at least a, a start at a systematic presentation of the human psyche. That's what we need in order to educate people about their own psyches. How can you start teaching students about their psyches unless you have a theory that has it all organized? I don't know how you would do it. So you need that organization uh, in order to help people grow and work with their own psyches. You have to give them some solid information and say, okay, now let's look at this in you, and you look at this in you, and let's see what we got here. And now you treat yourself as your project. You are your own project. This is called what Maslow was calling self-actualizing creativity. You are creating yourself. That's the whole idea. And you want a science that's going to help you do it because it's far too much for anybody to do all by themselves. It's far too much. So, so you need a science that's going to help you do it, but you need a science to help you do it. You don't need somebody lecturing you on how to do it. So it's very important that we get these terms uh, straightened out between self and ego. So what this means to me is ego I would reserve, for, again, this, all of this is subject to change because as we advance the theory, you, you may want to change it. But for the time being, the only, I see no reason not to start off with the assumption that ego is the third micro <coughs> in each chakra and that it's, it's distinct for each chakra. And that's ego. 
not self. So up until the end of the seventh chakra, we're not even talking about the self. Now Maslow uses the term self-actualizing creativity. He could have called it, <coughs> it would have sounded very strange if he had called it ego-actualizing creativity, but he, he didn't do that. And there's no, he hadn't read Shamshi because Shamshi's work was not available to him. So there was no reason to call it ego-actualizing creativity. But from the standpoint of uh, the system, the way that I'm presenting it to you, I would call it ego-actualizing creativity or ego-creativity. We'll leave out the actualizing for the moment. Ego-creativity, you're creating your ego. Now, if you keep working at creating your ego, eventually you will have a, an experience of self-remembering, as Uspensky is describing it. At that point, you can use the word self. But don't worry about that. Don't hold your breath. I mean, that, that can happen, or it may not happen. Don't worry about it. But it's the end result is that at a certain level of refinement of thinking, then uh, that will happen. Now, this is another point of Shamji's that I should stress for you. Uh, there are some uh, schools of spiritual thinking that uh, <coughs> deprecate thinking. I think, uh, I don't know enough about Buddhism, but my impression is Buddha called thinking the monkey, the monkey mind. And you have to uh, c control the monkey mind. Well, Shanti doesn't agree with that. The, mi the mind is a mind is a mind. The th thoughts are going to do whatever they do. They come. Some of you were complaining. They're coming, and they, they, you don't know how to control them. Well, <clears throat> you need, don't need to control them. You need to refine them. So there's a big difference between control and refinement. So as you learn to refine your thinking then you can be working more on the uh, refinement of ego. So it means, again, to use the word, I like the word refinement because it's talking about changing the uh, subtlety of the energy and working with a subtle energy. So you can think a thought in a very uh, aggressive, strong way, or you can think the same thought in a much more gentle way. And you learn, as part of this refinement of your thinking, to choose the gentle way, when you can. Now, since most of us are not raised that way, we're raised in one person shouting at the other, uh, for the most part, not, not all families are like that, but many are. Um, therefore, we tend to be noisy in our thinking. All right. Our brains are making more noise as we think than is absolutely necessary. And we accept that as normal because that's the way all the people around us are functioning also. It's the way our parents were functioning, with all of this noise and chatter in their systems. So we figure, well, that's, you know, that's, so that's just normal. It ain't. There's nothing normal about it, other than the fact that it's happening to you. And let me throw out another uh, concept for you which relates to this. And the concept is called inevitable sensory experience. I-N-E-V-I-T-A-B-L-E, -E, inevitable sensory experience. And this was taught to me by my, by my introductory psychology professor years ago. And he pointed out that in, by inevitable sensory experience, he means the things which are just going to happen to you by, due, due to the fact that you're around. So a little baby is going to get picked up by the mother. That just happens to him. The little baby is going to hear the particular rattle that the mother leaves in the cage with him. Okay, that's inevitable sensory experience. And then the baby adjusts to whatever these sensory stimulus is that is being presented to him. And doesn't, doesn't think about it. There's no logical uh, point to this. It's just that it happens, and he adjusts to it. And we all have, sub have been subjected to various forms of inevitable sensory experience. 
So what I'm pointing out to you is one of the forms of inevitable sensory experience that we have all experienced, most, that is probably most of us, uh, is loud voices. People talking loudly. And so we begin to speak at the same volume, our voice. And then we're surprised when somebody is talking in a way that is much more quiet. So what's, what's this all about? Now, there is something innate about the human that responds to quiet, that responds to silence, that we, if you think of divinity, it's often portrayed as silence. In the beginning was the word. Well, the word was existed against the background of silence. There's actually, there's a book out by, I wish I'd get the name for you. The, the author is Sardello, S-A-R-D-E-L-L-O. And it's either called Silence or it has the word silence in the title. But it's, a, it's out recent, relatively recently. And he, he discusses very intelligently the uh, significance of silence. So if any of you are interested in it, I would think it's worthwhile looking at Sardello's book. Um, and from that silence emerges the causal body. But the causal body is not just appearing from nowhere. It's appearing from the silence, which is again part of consciousness, an aspect of consciousness. And so it is very natural at a certain level of advanced human functioning for the human to respond to silence and to respond to light. Because that's fundamentally what we are. We are creatures of light living in silence. But the silence is not silent. Does this make any sense now? Hmm. The silence has its own sound. It's called silent sound. It's the sound of silence. Now for most people you say, well, what are you talking about? You're crazy? Sound of silence. There were, there's a, uh, there was a saying, supposedly this is God talking, I don't know who, where this came from. When you speak, I am silent. When you are silent, I speak. And when you open your big mouth, I'm not going to talk to you. But if you shut up, I'll give me a chance, I'll talk to you. There's a lot of wisdom in that. In other words, don't keep telling, giving God your opinion. Just shut up and listen. When you are silent, I speak. When you speak, I am silent. There is something in the spiritual path that enables people to respond to silence. That's why we practice, what do we practice here at the, uh, the Chakra Institute? Mona. How many have heard the expression Mona, M-O-N-A? Well, maybe, uh, Mona means silence. So, uh, there may be, I don't know what, what was done during this past uh, few days, but sometimes we have a period like, say, the morning, in which you don't talk, you are silent. That's to permit that silence to permeate you. It's not, it's not some sort of a rule, but it's, to, it's a rule that permits you to be like a sponge, to absorb silence. And the more you work at your spirituality, the more you will appreciate silence. There was a, uh, a famous book a number of years ago called uh, Notes from the Chalkboard or something like that. And there was this fa famous uh, yogi, excuse me, from uh, India who lived for most, for a, lo for a lot of his life in California. And uh, he would not speak, but he would write down on a chalkboard his various thoughts. Now why, why that would work, I don't know, but it did, I guess. And uh, <coughs> so Notes from the Chalkboard meant that he didn't want to use his vocal cords, so he wrote down and you could communicate with him by writing to him, writing notes to him on the chalkboard while he's standing there. 
So that's one extreme example of somebody really into silence. Um, silence permits your awareness to expand. Silence permits your awareness to contact consciousness more readily. And silence helps give you a different picture of who you are as a human being. The fact that you can appreciate silence in a real deep way tells you something about who you are. Because most of the people you meet on the street couldn't do that. They wouldn't know what you're talking about. But those who have done some spiritual work gravitate toward this. It's just very natural for them. Uh, and again, I may be mistaken here, but I believe that in some, uh, some of the practices of the Catholic Church, uh, there was silence was, was uh, practice was, was used. Um, other faiths also have used silence. So what you want to see is our thinking ultimately is emerging from silence. And the other thing that is very difficult thought to have, but I'm going to throw it at you anyways to give you the picture. Who is the thinker? We've been talking about thinking and all of that, ego, self. Who is the thinker when you're thinking? Bill, I'll pick on you. Well, I, I think it, it, usually it tends to be one of the chakra minds just, you know, yes. rattling off its stuff. Right. So, so <laughs> that's, that's the, who the thinker is. Generally. Yeah, generally, if, that's if correct. There is another one. But, are the, but is, there, is, there, is, there some, is there another answer to this? I'm sure there is. It is one of the chakra minds, or um, maybe I can phrase the question better. Um, okay, I, I talked to you a little earlier about the wisdom of the over self. Over self is not one of the chakra minds. So when I was thinking, um, who is the thinker? I really, the answer I was looking for was the over-self, which is not one of the chakra minds. Uh, Enrique? Is the over-self related to the super-ego? No. Shamji asked me that question. <laughs> I was talking to him about it. Uh, no, they're, they're, they're completely different concepts. Super-ego was Freud, and he had his whole system. Uh, uh, over-self is a Sagioli, and it was a completely different system. Yeah, from Freudian stand, super ego is completely different. Yeah, yeah. But they do talk about super ego in the other, like I think in Buddhism, like super consciousness or super ego. I don't. I don't know enough about Buddhism to say anything very intelligent about it. Um, so I don't. I don't know. Yeah. Yes. When you ask who is, I mean, are you talking about? one person's experience of the who, or is it the perceived experience of the who? If it is an over-soul, like, maybe not everyone is consciously connected to that over-soul, so are they still, you know, like, <laughs> I'm trying to map it, but it's hard to... It's hard to separate it all out. Yeah, or well, it also depends on, you know, subject-object, like, whose definition. Well, it's, it's hard, but it's not impossible. And, it's, and uh, in certain circumstances, it may be worth the effort, okay? Sometimes it's not worth the effort, but sometimes it is. Um, the, it is worth the effort if you're talking about experiences over several days or several weeks or several months or several years over some sort of a time frame. So if over a certain time frame you have experiences which you feel mean something to you if you use the concept of the over-self, 
That's important. If you don't have any such experiences, then it probably doesn't make any difference. But if you find that the over-self concept resonates with you during that period of time in which you're having these experiences, then you want to keep using it because it's telling you something. Okay? And uh, these are part, remember we said vocabulary is important. That's why we're spending time on this. That these issues of vocabulary, which I'm raising with you, we're raising now within the context of expanding microchakra psychology to deal with the causal body in, in detail. That's, that's what we're trying to do. So that will, as I say, this won't, that won't get resolved this afternoon. But we have opened our minds to starting that, uh, that discussion. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, David, so the, the, the question arises, which thoughts can we trust? You know, mm. I, I'm assuming that uh, the thoughts that come from your over self are trustworthy. But yes. there are thought, most of our thoughts, uh, or at least many of them, are not trustworthy because they originate in a, a misperception of the ego. Yes, you're correct. Mm -hmm. So how do you know which right. are? How do you know which is which? Mm -hmm. You have to have experience with yourself, with your thinking. Yeah, it can, it can in other words, you have, you have to be critical of yourself. And you have to, ra you're, you're raising the, the, the perfect question. How, how can I trust this thought? So if you have a thought <coughs> and it's suggesting a particular course of action, first thing you ask yourself is, okay, uh, what are the consequences of my following it versus my consequences of my not following that suggestion? And then you use your rational mind to evaluate the pluses and the minuses of that suggestion. And then you say, which is trustworthy? No, you end up not saying which is trustworthy. You say, which do I trust? And that becomes your decision, your karma, that you chose to trust this particular suggestion coming out of your mind, but you suggest you're trusting it. Whereas another suggestion could, could, could have come out of your same mind, and then you bring your rational processes to bear upon that, and you say, no, no, there's something wrong here. I'm not going to do that, even though that's what my, my mind is suggesting. So the, the process of, of correct thinking yeah. is really a trial and error process. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You learn by experience to think wisely. Is that where intuition comes in to play? Intuition is a very useful shortcut. Intuition is the sixth chakra or the sixth micro chakra of a particular chakra mind. Now, if you have your, those uh, micro chakras open, then your intuition is more likely than not to give you correct intuition. In other words, if it's, if it's, if it's wrong advice, it's not coming out of the sixth micro chakra. So what is intuition? It's not of the mind? Intuition is not of mind? Well, very good question. Intuition is of the mind because intuition is part of the mind, okay? So that's not how we phrase the question. Intuition, though, is a special, a special aspect of the mind. Um, uh, it's more like the over-self, no? Oh, yes. Absolutely it's more like the over-self. Because the center of the sixth of the uh, intuition is the sixth chakra, yeah. and the sixth micro chakra in each chakra is the intuition. Of, excuse me, of that chakra. <coughs> um, so it's using a different. It's using more sattvic energy. It's more in other words, the 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 usual the ego of the energy, the third micro chakra, is using the fire energy fire element of that mind, okay? That's going to be much less certain 
are trustworthy, if you want to use your language, then activity which is based upon the uh, energies in the sixth microchuckle. It's not the fire element, it has more to do with the akasha. Could you say that intuition could be defined as ultra-refined thinking? Mm. <laughs> well, we have a problem here. You could say that, and it might be a right way to do it. Because intuition comes to us in the form of what we would call thoughts. Not necessarily. Uh, the reason I say that, thoughts generally, now we run into, what we're doing is we're starting to move from one gray area into another and we have and there's transitions and all of that. Um, ego usually, thoughts usually are associated with ego, which is usually associated with a fire element. There's a very strong, it's a strong energy. Intuition is regarded as something which is not of the fire element. It's either of air or of akasha. The processing of information is, in other words, we tend to avoid the whole, some of this, these vocabulary issues in modern psychology by simply referring to information processing. So there is information processing which, use, which is based on certain elements, information, other information processing based on other elements. So the question, question is, what elements are being used in the information processing? So normally when you think of a thought, you're thinking of information processing which is based on the fire element. However, you can get information processing based on the uh, akasha, which is, base, which is intuition. So the information is being processed through a different element. Now I'll tell you what you just forced me to do. I have to uh, let you know that I have uh, recently been introduced to the thinking of Mantak Chia, M-A-N-T-A-K-C-H-I-A. He is a uh, Taoist, T-A-O-I-S-T, a Taoist writer. Brilliant. He has written a number of books on Taoism. There is an interesting overlap between what he says and what Shamji says, but they are not identical. And I've yet to, I haven't had the time to make all of the exploration that is required in order to compare and contrast these two, these two systems. But he also is he's very uh, much into the elements. Now the elements in the Chinese system are not, it's interesting, they're not the same as the Hindu system. In the Chinese system, they have uh, wood and uh, metal, metal as, as elements. Mm -hmm. They are not in the uh, Hindu system. In the Hindu system, they have akasha and uh, space and, and air, excuse me, and air as elements. And uh, why that difference exists, I do not know, but it's something I need to find out more mm -hmm. about. But what he's, what he is pushing me to do by reading what I have read of him so far is to take our thinking more to the level of the elements which is what Shamji gets into when he gets into mantra. He's, he's, he's really working with the elements. Mm -hmm. So ultimately microchakra psychology will, should have more to say about the elements and the relationship between thinking. But that's down the road so. The yeah. sixth chakra yeah. is beyond the elements. And, and well, it depends. No, no, it depends on what you call the elements. Beyond the elements are the gunas. The, the, everything up to the gunas are elements. Right. So sixth chakra is not uh, the seventh chakra. The gunas yeah. are in the seventh chakra. Well, first five chakras, the five elements. Sixth chakra, beyond the elements, the realm of the gunas. But six chakra is also the realm of intuition. So it's intuition beyond thinking. Is intuition a subset of thinking? It can't be beyond. An entirely different animal. Depends on how we want to define thinking. 
I mean, the questions you're raising are all legitimate questions, but I'm saying at the top of my head, I can't give you good answers because I think that in order to give good answers, we have to do much more, I at least have to do much more exploration uh, to uh, get deeper and deeper into this because it forces us. And I think this is one of the advantages of this theory of uh, microchakras is it forces you to do with the sort of thing you're asking for. And yeah, a prime concern for most of us in this work is that, that concept of trust that I raised. You know, thoughts come to us as saboteurs. Yes, often, yes. And yet, some of them are champions. So it, it, sometimes it's very difficult to, uh, to sort them discern uh, which thought is a saboteur and which is a champion. You know, and, and it would help us greatly if we could increase our powers of discernment so that we could know the difference. You want a saboteur detector. <laughs> be nice. <laughs> well, that, that's an extra 10 bucks. Uh, I'd pay it. I would pay it. Yeah, 10 bucks. But isn't the David awareness the key to knowing the difference um, between if you're if these thoughts derive from ego or from higher self. Like I'm sorry, I did not hear the first part of your isn't question. Isn't the awareness the key to knowing the difference and having a discernment? Yes, yeah. that's correct. Yeah, you, have you have to develop your awareness. In other words, you don't get, even for 10 bucks, you're not going to get <laughs> a, a, uh, an automatic saboteur detector. You, the, uh, you, have, you have to become the automatic saboteur detector. And... Uh, the uh, I think uh, you know, Jack. I think actually that that is uh, part of your karma. In other words, I think that there is a there is a relation. In other words, we're covering a number of uh, theoretical points with this system. But each one of you in this room is are going to be able to make use of some of these points and not others. And it's not going to be the same for everybody. And um, I think your ability to use them is part of your karmic package. In other words, there are people, listen, there are people who have been in Shamji's classes over the years that I've seen them, I've watched them. And they come and they go. And some are stay for various lengths of time. And they pick up whatever they pick up. Often what it is is they have some immediate pressing problem and he helps them with them. But then when the problem is solved, they're gone for whatever reasons. You stung, you've hung around. So it means that you're getting more and more out of the system. Now that means that somehow karmically, you're going to make much more use of this system than the people who are in and out. And as part of it, I think that, that your karmic uh, pers uh, perspe your karmic perspectives are related to what you are doing. And I, I think that that is going to be what's really going to be your, your, uh, your saboteur detector. In other words, the saboteur detector is going to be Jack with X number of years of experience in working with the system. Mm -hmm. And each year, you know, you should be getting better at it. So it should, saboteur should be less dangerous to you as the years go by. That that's would be how I would look at this thing. Uh, I don't foresee an automatic saboteur detector, uh, that would, even that we can sell. Um, okay, any other questions on this? Yes. I'd like to understand the process of uh, how does it happen that subtle energy in refining our thoughts? I know what you said, meditate, meditate, put throw light on the particular thought, and your thoughts will eventually become more refined. So I'd like to understand that process. Can one understand it with one's mind, or is that something? Can you understand the process of refinement? Of refining your, the the energy that refines thinking. 
Yes, you can. There, there's what things. What is that process? Okay, there are certain things I think we can we can cover there. Um, the first step in refining your thinking is to make it less noisy. Now, if I ask you now to think, uh, think about the word dog. Okay. So you ha you have certain uh, sound in your mind that represents dog? Sound? Yeah, is there a sound, D-O-G, dog? Not that I can think of. I mean, when I hear dog, I think of my dog. Okay, so yeah. you're, you're thinking of, of a, a vision, of a picture. Of a vision, yes. A picture of, a, of your dog. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, then maybe that's not a good example for you. Um, let's take something else. Um, Traffic. Can you think of anything with traffic? Yes, yellow cabs, tons of traffic on Park Avenue, let's say. Yeah, Congestion. okay. Congestion. So, uh, now, yeah, that's vision. Do you also get any sound with it? Yes. Okay. Now, can you, can you hear that sound? Yes. Okay. Now, can you make that sound more quiet than you initially heard it? It seems I can put it into the distance. Okay, you're, you're, you're making the sound in the distance, that's fine. So it's less noisy. Yes. Okay? You've just refined your mind. But I've just obliterated the sound. From well, you, you didn't necessarily have to obliterate it because it could still be there, even, but it's not as intense. You, you've reduced the intensity of the sound. Again, it goes back to me. I've done it. It was my yeah. action that brought about. Yeah, you, who else reduced the sound? I didn't reduce it. So it's my own energy that reduces, the, that makes the thoughts finer. Yes. My own. Yes. And what do you mean exactly by finer? In this case, uh, it's less intense. The sound is less intense, less noisy. So it's not that there's a divine... No, 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 no. divinity's got nothing to do with this example. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It has to do with your adjustment of your sensory system. And your internal use of your own sensory system. So initially you heard a, a sound of a certain intensity, and I asked you to reduce it, and you did. Yes. And I'm saying the way you did it was with your own mind. So in trusting your own mind, it's mind analyzing mind. Yes. It's very difficult, to, as you were saying, it's very difficult to differentiate which is a true thought, is a true answer, and which is... No, it's, 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 yeah, it might be starting off, it might be difficult. But as I was saying to Jack, if he's been at it for a number of years, the chances are that he's getting better at it. In other words, it's, you're using your discrimination, you're using your own power of discrimination, and the more you use it, it's like a muscle. If you start using your muscles, they're going to get bigger. If you start using your own mental discrimination at, on the ref, uh, with the effort toward refinement, it's going to get better at doing it. In other words, you're, you're improving yourself, which is the point of the whole matter. Yes. No, it's a comment. It's a comment. Just a comment. Mm -hmm. yes, a comment. I think the, the world is like it is right now because our thoughts, because the way we think, no? So with, I think we should use less 
the brain just for only for uh, ciertas actividades for for certain activities only uh, como precisas precise um, but we should put more our heart we should use more our heart that that can be a solution that can be useful mm -hmm. yeah the um, Yeah, using using the heart energy is very very important. In yes. fact, the whole the whole idea of uh, not the whole idea, but a major uh, focus of uh, spiritual development is the fourth chakra. Mm -hmm. And the more you can use the fourth chakra energy, the better. So, for example, and we were talking about uh, the sound and the traffic. Um, there are people who could stand in the middle of New York and this buzzing traffic is all around them and they could have feel, feelings of divine connection and they could be trying to bless the people of New York and standing there in, on Fifth Avenue and having a certain amount of extra energy in their hearts. You can imagine such a person. Not common, but they could exist. That's a very different kind of uh, way of doing it, but it's possible. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Well, that's it then. But sometimes uh, the mind is going on and on and on and on. The thoughts are just spewing away. And I find I just have to say, you know, like to a child, stop it. Well, that, that's fine. In fact, one of the things I needed to mention to you is Uspensky had an exercise that he called the stop exercise. And the stop exercise was you just stop. So that if, if the chatter is going on, you may, you may just little physically stop your movement of your body. Just sit still. Just stop. Don't do anything. Just, just observe it. Mm -hmm. So your, your, your most fundamental mental capacity is a capacity to observe. Mm -hmm. This is called witness, witnessing. Mm -hmm. And if you can just witness, in other words, let this chatter of the mind keep going, and you withdraw, like you were doing earlier when you said you withdraw from the sound, you withdraw your mind and you just witness it. Mm -hmm. And as you just witness it, then it's not bothering you as much. See, it's bothering you because you're somehow identifying with it. You're, 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 you're giving it more attention than it has earned. Definitely. And because you're giving it more attention than it has earned, it's running away with it. It's like a little kid. You, you know, you, you look, at, look, look at me. Yeah, yeah. So, so you can uh, withdraw your attention and uh, it, it, it weakens it. I used to have a technique that I would take all these thoughts that I didn't want to deal with and I would put them on a vessel and send them down the river. Okay. And I'd say, okay, I'll pick out one thought and look at it for a while. Okay. I'll deal with yeah. that one, and then I'd pick another one from the vessel. That's, that's fine. That. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think our, our time is up, so I will uh, wish you good luck with the remainder of the program. Thank you very much. You're very okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.